In 2 Timothy chapter 4, the Apostle Paul writes to a very young Timothy and he gives him a very solemn charge to be a faithful minister of the gospel of Christ. And so that's why in the same way this morning, like the Apostle Paul did for Timothy, I want to do for you and I want to give you a charge. In January this coming year, I have the joy of celebrating the start of my 25th year of full-time pastoral ministry. And so in a sense, I come and stand here with a 25-year head start on you. And uh, I have to say that if it wasn't for God's grace that we've been singing about and the encouragement of special people along the way, I may not have made it. And that same grace is available to all of us today. And there's no guarantees why that you or I will make it any further apart from his grace. And so therefore, as why Zulu, as Paul begins in 2 Timothy chapter 4, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. And I want to give you seven charges very briefly from the Apostle Paul's letters. Charge number one, Zwai Zulu, minister truthfully. Minister truthfully. 2 Timothy chapter 4, continuing the passage I've just read from verse 2. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine, Instead, to suit their own desires, they'll gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. So I speak the truth of God's word in season and out of season, when it's popular and even when it's unpopular. There'll be times when you will need to bring correction to the people that you're ministering to and correction to your own soul. There'll be times when you need to bring rebuke. There'll be times the word of God says to encourage with great patience. Patience is a great virtue as we know, but even more so for pastors in the ministry. With great patience, says the Apostle Paul, and careful instruction. Don't be surprised if you feel the pressure to cut corners in terms of the truth. If you cut corners in order to please people more than you desire to please God, then in fact you haven't loved those people, you have hated them and you have turned them aside from the truth. Speak the truth when it's easy and it makes you popular and successful in the eyes of the world, but then also speak the truth when it is difficult and when you need to be a prophetic voice that speaks into injustice and you become unpopular and maybe even maligned and hated. You are a herald on mission from the king. You have no right to manipulate the word of God. None of us do. We are heralds given a faithful message which we must faithfully deliver. And it may bring persecution. You may be misjudged like the prophets of old. But so I minister in the knowledge that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming. You do this in view of his presence, his coming, and his kingdom. And just like they did the prophets of old, you may find the road more difficult than you thought. And so I charge you, minister truthfully. Number two, I charge you, Zwaizulu, minister relationally. Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 2.8 says, we loved you so much that we desired not only to share the gospel of God with you, but our lives as well, because you become so dear to us. And we've sensed from the testimonies that that's really been the case. Romans 12.15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. As a pastor, you are choosing to wrap up your life in the lives of people. And you will see a side of life that very few people get to see because it'll take you into the hidden recesses of people's lives. And so I wanna encourage you, don't let the tsunami of pain and tragedy and sometimes the sin that you will see and the unfaithfulness and the brokenness of the world to make you think that that's the only side of life. Don't let that harden your own heart. The people you minister to will be both your greatest blessing and also your greatest disappointment. To love them well means to open yourself up to them. In fact, to open yourself up to be hurt by them and disappointed, but also to be surprised and wowed. 
There'll be some that you will invest hours discipling, and I think of a number in my own ministry, some whose very doors I went to knock on and they refused to open those doors, some that were near to me, some that had, I had discipled for years who turned their backs on God, and when they saw me in the mall or somewhere else, they avoided me because I represent all that they abandoned. And, and there's pain and there's hardship in investing in people knowing that some will fall away. But the opposite is also true, that some that you meet might show very little potential when you meet them. You might prejudge them. You might put them in a box and they might surprise you at the potential that they end up being the greatest allies in ministry, those who multiply their lives, all because God used your love to impact them. As Howard Hendricks once said, you can impress people from a distance, but you can only impact them up close. You can impress people from a distance, but you can only impact them up close. And so don't just share the gospel with people, share your life as well. Long after people have forgotten your best sermon, they've forgotten your best strategic plan, after they've forgotten your best advice, all the wisdom you gave them, they'll remember that you loved them. They'll remember how you made them feel. They will remember how you invested in them and loved them and sought to mature them in the gospel. Jesus, our great shepherd, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The Lord Jesus Christ smelt like sheep because he was with the sheep. And so my challenge to you is party with the people, mourn with the people, go to weddings with the people, do all that the Lord Jesus Christ did. Feast and eat and drink and rejoice and weep among them. And so I charge you, minister relationally. Number three, minister faithfully. Galatians chapter six and verse seven and following gives us this amazing biological principle. The apostle Paul writing to the churches of Galatia says a man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. But the one who sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. As a pastor, you've chosen to give your life to the future in some sense, to invest daily in what you can't always see. You're sowing seeds that do not immediately bear fruit and there will come many a night when you'll put your head on the pillow and you'll say, what have I accomplished today? I can't see the fruit. There's been all this investment. Where is the fruit, Lord? And I wanna encourage you, keep sowing those seeds. Don't grow weary. The apostle Paul says to us, for if we do not give up, we will reap a harvest at the right time. At the right time. Don't slow down. Don't give up when the growth is slow. Every seed we sow is accomplishing something under the surface of the soil that you and I cannot see. And so just because we can't see it doesn't mean we stop. We keep sowing, we sow widely, we sow generously, we sow faithfully, we sow diligently. Look into eternity with the eye of faith and you'll be surprised at what God does. And so I charge you, Zwei Zulu, minister faithfully. Number four. Minister authentically, authentically. 1 Timothy chapter four and verse 16. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So why there's a danger here that if you don't persevere in your faith, it may be evidence that you never had faith to begin with and your persevering in faith also has an impact on the perseverance of the faith of those that you lead. And so Paul says, watch both your life and your doctrine closely. Be an authentic example in both your strengths and your failings. I remember a pastor that I met with who confessed to me that he was lying to his congregation and lying to those that he was discipling about how successful his, his life was in terms of quiet times and devotion. He said, I felt the pressure that I need to be an authentic example and then I challenged him, so you felt that in order to be an authentic example, you would lie to your people and those nearest to you and pretend to be what you're not? Never lie. Model what Christ looks like through your life. And where you can't model what Christ looks like because we're all on this journey ourselves, model what vulnerable repentance looks like. Show your people what repentance looks like. Too much is at stake. 
We all can list this morning pastors that have fallen, who have failed to watch either their life or failed to watch their doctrine and gone into heresy. Too many hypocrites are found in leadership. As a pastor, your example carries a huge weight of responsibility. That's why Paul says not many of us should presume to be teachers because our lives both count impactfully for good but also impactfully for evil and for bad. Confront sin in your life. Pursue holiness. Say no to ungodliness. Say no to sexual immorality. Say no to all the paths that lead to sexual immorality before you go down that road. Say no to greed. Say no to laziness. No to anger. Watch what influences your theology and your outlook on life. Watch your sleep and your energy levels. Watch your health and your exercise. Model gentleness and patience and also model courage and boldness Model what it means to live by faith, to pray, to be devoted to the scriptures, to be devoted to God, to maintain your integrity even when only God can see. You may face persecution and opposition, not just from the world but even from the church. Stand firm when you are maligned and falsely accused. Let your integrity speak without the need to vindicate yourself. And where the criticism is true, listen to it, repent, apologize, ask for forgiveness. Early in ministry, someone said these words to me. He said, Justin, you can teach what you know, but you reproduce what you are. You can teach what you know, but you reproduce what you are. And so watch your life and doctrine closely. I therefore charge you, Zwazulu, minister authentically. Number five, minister strategically. Strategically. In a large church, there are all sorts of pressures I think the calls don't stop, the demands don't stop, the emails keep coming. Priorities will scream for your attention and those of you in any large organization know what that is like. But there's something about sheep in the church. They can be demanding. Did you know that sheep can even bite, right? Look at these wonderful, innocent looking people. They're wonderful on a Sunday. But even sheep can bite. And you'll be tempted to give yourself more to all the fires that need to be put out, doing what is immediately visible. This is tangible, this is visible, I gotta do this now. And you will be tempted to neglect what is truly strategic, what is long-term. All the things that, that, that Satan knows, if he can keep you from mission, he'll do that. And so you have to put boundaries in your life to be strategic. Your ministry is only as good as your marriage to Z and your family your investment in the lives of Zoe and Nati and Langer. Be strategic about spending quality time with them. They are your first disciples. You dare not disciple the whole world and fail to disciple those closest to you. The same sheep that, that bite when you don't jump to meet their demands are the same sheep that will bite you when your marriage falls apart or your family hates church. Then they'll say, well, what kind of pastor didn't look after his wife and family? So if sheep are gonna bite on either side, I would encourage you, make sure that you don't neglect your family. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 4.11, here's his strategy for pastors, and he lists other qualifications as well, but let me just focus on pastors. He says, it was he, Christ, it was Christ who gave some to be pastors and teachers, to do what, Zohar? To prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. That is our role as pastors. It is to equip you for works of service. It's not so that we can do all the ministry. I could play piano every week, sing every Sunday, lead worship every Sunday, and no one else would have the blessing that I enjoy. I could visit all the hospitals, do all the counseling, uh, do all the weddings, all the funerals, everything, and get all the glory. But that's not the way God has designed it. Ministering strategically means prioritizing, equipping over doing everything yourself. You'll be tempted to love the glory of being in control. I mean, why? who can minister as well as you can? That's gonna be what you think. It's gonna boost your ego. ego. We all wanna be wanted. I wanna be the fount of all knowledge and wisdom and have my wisdom change the world. All come to me. No, please don't. But I'm talking (laughs) hypothetically now. Don't all make appointments. But it's why the strategic role of being a pastor is to equip God's people. Always invite others into ministry with you. What a blessing for me to have Ryan with me in Ukraine. And just to invite him in, suddenly dawn on me, I've been going to Ukraine all these years alone, invite him in. 
Invite others into your ministry. Always work yourself out of a job because you are multiplying and reproducing yourself. Have a look at this diagram on the screen. This will illustrate ministering strategically. There's an evangelist who seems very faithful and assuming he doesn't burn out and he ministers for 25 years and he reaches by himself 5,000 converts per year. What a successful ministry. 125,000 people he reaches. But he did it largely by himself and obviously in the power of God's Holy Spirit and so on and we would say, what a successful ministry. But I believe God's word in Ephesians 4.11 calls you rather to be like a discipler, equipper. If in year one you just discipled one other person to look like you, Zariah, with all your strengths and with all your weaknesses and to repent and to go before God and you equip that person to do the same in the life of somebody else, at the end of year two there'd be four of you and to keep doing that and after the same 25 years, God willing, you would have reached 33 million people. That's the power of multiplication. So ministering strategically means putting your marriage and family as a key priority, it means prioritizing equipping over doing it yourself, and it also means living missionally. I wanna challenge you, always have breathing room in your life to be with unbelievers. Don't you let your life become so wrapped around the church that you don't have time to see the gospel at work in the lives of people that don't know Christ. This is why I charge you, minister strategically. And then number six, minister sacrificially. Ephesians 6, 7, Paul says, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does. People won't see our silent prayers, the prayers that you and I pray, the nights that you'll lie awake wrestling over people's souls and their broken situations. People will never know the money and time that you'll probably never get reimbursed for, the things that you will loan that will never be returned, the love that you will show that might not always be reciprocated, the hours of ministry that people will consume but may never thank you for. You'll probably hear more from people when things go badly than when things go well. Ministry will cost you many things, both of you, as a couple and as a family. But I want you to remember Jesus who sacrificed his life, who gave all to save you. Follow in his footsteps and go beyond what is expected. People won't know all that you have sacrificed to see them become mature in Christ, but take rest in the fact that you're serving the Lord. His eye is on you and he will reward you for what is done in the secret place. And that is true for all of us. That when we go into that quiet place of prayer, when we even pray for our leaders and no one sees that, maybe we're not even aware of how much we are prayed and loved and cared for, all of your faithful giving to support the work of Rosebank Union Church, that's often not celebrated, there's not fanfares. So much of the Christian life is God rewarding us for what is done in secret. And so is why I charge you, minister sacrificially. And then my last point, number seven. I want to charge you to minister devotionally. Philippians 3.10, Paul the great apostle said, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. By becoming a pastor, you are choosing to know Christ, to be devoted to Christ, to put God above even ministry itself. The greatest danger of ministry is that you would find your identity in being a pastor that you'd find your identity in serving the king instead of loving the king. And in serving the king, don't forget the king. Find your identity in who you are in Christ. Pastoring must be the byproduct of loving God for God. I remember being told once, Justin, the Jesus we know is the Jesus they get. You can't take people further than where you are spiritually in your walk with Christ. The Jesus that you know is the Jesus your people will get. No Christ. Find your identity in what God says about you, not what people say about you. Don't let encouragement go to your head and swell you up, but also don't let discouragement go so to your heart that it just breaks you. You are who he says you are. And that means sometimes you do need to listen, even to your greatest critics and your greatest enemies, even if they didn't express the truth in love. Listen, Take it before the Lord, allow him to filter it and then repent and do what you need to to be more Christ-like and the same is true of encouragement. 
and discouragement. Take them before the Lord and allow him to value you, allow him to expose you. So I, I charge you, minister devotionally. So as I close this, this brief message, being a pastor is a long and winding road. It has some of the most breathtaking, amazing views, but it also has some of the deepest, darkest valleys. And how on earth will this one life make a difference? How on earth will your life make a difference? You're one person. Can God really use you? How can you change anyone? How can you save a soul? How can you go into a broken home? How can you change the situations in your family and amongst your neighbors and in our country? How on earth can we do that? You can't because someone has already come and we know his name. His name is Jesus because he's the one who first knew our name and he first knew your names, right? He's Jesus Christ, the God-man, and our role, and so why your role, is to simply point a feeble finger towards Christ and say, look to him, look to him. I think if I'd known up front the kinds of places that this road of ministry would have taken me on, I may never have taken that first step. But you know what? God doesn't give you grace decades in advance. He gives you grace for each new day to take each new step. And God's grace has brought all of us safe this far, and it's his grace that will lead us home. And so Paul closes his charge to young Timothy with these words in 2 Timothy 4, 7. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. So I, Zulu, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Minister truthfully, relationally, faithfully, authentically, strategically, sacrificially, and devotionally. Make sure Christ is first. And church, won't you remember to pray for Zwai? Won't you remember to encourage him and to support him and to hold him accountable? Who is equal to these things? There is no man apart from God's grace that can do any of what I've said. And so won't you pray that God's grace would be given in great measure to Zwai and to Z and to their family.